particular area. Um, again, it's not a perfect science, so we don't use definitive terms. Um, it is subjective, but based on science. So it is not um, unusual to have competing um, consultants on a case. So um, the defense will have a blood stain pattern an analyst that will say one thing, and then the um, def uh, defense or prosecution, I don't remember which one I just said, but the opposite would have um, a different expert, and then they would say what things they agreed on and what things they don't agree on. And that is um, basically left to the jury to determine who's, um, they value. So the jury is always the ultimate arbiter of the value of evidence. So um, why can we use uh, blood to reconstruct facts? Well, blood acts predictably. It does predictable things. Um, so we can use some of these different properties of blood to determine what blood did when blood does what it does. Um, one of the reasons that we can do that or one of the properties of blood that make it of value to us is that it's, it has a strong cohesion. So um, it's a lot of like molecules and they really like each other. So it stays together really, really well. Um, and then it stays together and in a, until something breaks that tension. So that's when we talk about that impact. So the blood is falling and it's gonna continue just doing what it does until something gets in its way. It's gonna stay together. Um, mass is one of the things that we look at. So in mass, I described to my students, it's like hitting a baseball or a bowling ball, but using the same bat, right? So if you have the same bat and you hit a baseball, it's gonna go really far. If you hit a bowling ball, it's not going to go as far. Um, gravity, so gravity makes blood predictable because what goes up must come down. Um, the different surfaces that blood lands on is very important. Um, so we always look at the substrate that the blood has landed on. Um, viscosity is something that we take into account. So blood is much more viscous than water, about six to 10 times. So, um, and by viscous, we just mean it's thicker than water. Um, we have to take into account things like temperature, wind, um, and the parabolic arc, which is something that happens because of gravity. So you have a blood that's dropping, you have some kind of impact that takes place, and then that blood's going to travel downward because of gravity. But that can be sped up by things that are happening in the air, like humidity, okay? If it's more humid or less humid. If there's a lot of wind helping carry it or slow it. Um, if there is um, been a lot of shooting in the area and there's a lot of um, uh, gunshot residue in the air. Okay, those kinds of things might slow it. Because of all those kind of unknowns and those variables, that's why we say that blood stain pattern analysis is not a perfect science. It is, um, blood is predictable, but what happened at the scene is not predictable. So we can gather as much information as we possibly can, but we can't know everything. So even if we got there 10 minutes after the event, the amount of um, uh, going to the example of the gunshot residue floating through the air, the gunpowder, and it will have disseminated to the point that it's not going to be exactly like it was prior. So being able to recreate all of those things in the lab later are more difficult. So those are the things that we have to try and take into account when we are doing a reconstruction. So because um, blood is predictable and because math is really cool, we can use trigonometry of blood stains to determine their flight. So, um, sorry, I have a typo right there. It makes me crazy. All right. So passive drops are basically drops that nothing's applied to them. It's just simple gravity. So I cut my finger and I'm standing here and I'm just dripping. That's a passive drop. It's going to drop and when it lands, it's basically at 90 degrees. It's going to be circular in shape. 
And basically when we do the math on that, it'll be about 90 degrees. Now, if that drop is um, impacted at some point, then when it lands, it's going to elongate and its tail will be its direction of travel. And then we can use its um, body to determine its width divided by length, um, multiplied by the inverse of sine to determine its um, angle of impact. And that's how we do a stringing. So I'll clarify that in a little bit. All right, so let's see if I can play this. It's just going to show you a little bit about a blood drop. Welcome to this activity, surface tension of a blood drop. As blood trickles downward from a finger, the blood drop grows or accumulates and forms a single drop. A single drop breaks free, briefly forming a teardrop shape. Surface tension pulls the blood drop together vertically and horizontally. The blood drop forms into a spheroid and remains in that shape until it impacts the surface. In this example, a drop of blood falls from a wrench. As blood trickles downward from the surface, the blood drop grows or accumulates and forms a single drop. A single drop breaks free briefly forming a teardrop shape. The surface tension pulls the blood drop together vertically and horizontally. The blood drop forms into a spheroid and remains in that shape until it impacts the surface. So you can see that blood, we always have it in our mind, even like if you go to a blood donation site or whatever, it shows it in that teardrop. But really for our purposes, we think of blood as being a perfectly round 360 degree little ball um, because that's how we have to think of it um, in terms of its flight. So think of blood in terms of round spheres instead of teardrops. And that round sphere and the way that it lands on a substrate or a surface is how come we can determine its different patterns. So when we look at the patterns, we're going to look at three different or three main categories of patterns. So we're going to look at passive blood stain patterns, which are the ones, like I said, that are nothing is happening to them. Um, it's just gravity. And this would include things like drops, series of drops, flow patterns, and blood pools. Then we have projected pat patterns, which are basically that some kind of force has been applied. And that's gonna include your low, medium, high impact, or cast off, arterial spurting, and all these things that we'll look at. Some pictures up here in a minute. And then we have transfer contact blood stains, and those are patterns that are created when some kind of object comes in into uh, contact with another surface. Um, so we'll look at some of these and I'll make it easier. All right, so I don't know why those are first. Where are passive? It's all right, we'll go with this here. All right, so um, transfer and contact patterns. So basically this is just when a bloody item has made contact with a surface. So in this example here to the far um, left, you see basically what you can tell is the beginning of a shoe print. And I don't know, does, can anybody recognize this particular scene here in the middle? It's famous, but it will date me. Yeah, so that's from the O.J. Simpson case. So the Bruno, Mar the Bruno Marley shoes or whatever that he was wearing, um, he left blood patterns and then they were able to take those shoes and tie them back to him at a later time. So um, transfer or a contact pattern. Um, this obviously is a hand. So hand was in blood and then touched the surface. Um, here we have just swipes and wipes. You'll see a lot of these at um, bloody scenes where hair 
it's if someone's had a head injury and then their head keeps hitting a wall, they end up being these um, swipes all over the wall of hair. Um, here we have some where they've been wiped. So wipes are when there is blood already on a surface and something wipes through it. And then here we have just a transfer stain, um, but it's, I don't know, I don't think you can see it because you can't get close enough to it. But um, if you look at this photo up close, you'll see that that is not a bare foot, it is a foot that had a sock on it. So you can see the little indentations of the fabric on the sock. Passive patterns. So passive patterns, remember, are the ones where you simply have gravity. Um, so this would be a passive pattern on a uh, smooth surface, and it's 90 degrees, perfectly circular, right? Here it is on a, this is a wooden floor, so it's a little more um, broken apart on a porous surface, and you can see that it ends up with little spines and satellite spatter coming out from around it. This would be a saturation stain. So the difference in a saturation stain and um, a blood pooling is that a saturation stain is something that would happen on like your bedding or on the carpet if you're bleeding, um, versus it would pull if you were on a linoleum floor, right? So it's going to um, be different depending on the substrate that it lands on. And these stairs over here, this sometimes um, people can mistake this for an impact spatter of some sort, but that's really just blood dripping into blood. So when blood continues to drip into blood, it can leave a lot of little spat, uh, satellites around it. And it can be um, misinterpreted as um, an impact spatter when it's not, it's simply gravity. Um, projected patterns. So when we talk about impact spatter and how we do the math and everything, remember we talked about we have this round sphere and then it lands and then it, um, so it's basically coming down, coming down, it hits something and then it's, it kind of squishes itself out long. So it ends up looking something like this, elongated. But remember when we're looking at elongated, we're also looking at the tail for the direction of travel. So it's it can, it kind of looks like the top is the head and that's the direction it should be going, but actually the skinny end or the tail is the direction that it's going. So keep that in mind as well. And then this is how we would do a stringing. So we would pick um, for an impact spatter, uh, we might pick, you know, 10 to 15 of the best um, usable uh, drops. And we would determine the angle of impact for each of those individually. And then we would um, basically, the way we do that is we put a micrometer up to the wall, do a measurement, do the calculation, determine the angle. Once we know the angle, we'll put a piece of string, we use a protractor, determine what that angle is, say 45 degrees, and then we run that string out 45 degrees to the ground and tape it to the ground. Where all of these strings converge is our area of convergence. And it is not a point of convergence, okay? Because a point, you know, um, that terminology kind of means that it all came to one exact place. And that's not the case. We are not that specific. So we use an area. And in this area, you can see this is where the impact would have taken place. That means if someone had a bat and they hit somebody in the head, that's about where that bat made impact to um, cause the, the blood to spatter out. Um, projected patterns, again, um, we're looking at here something like arterial spurt. So if someone is cut in a major artery, every time your blood pumps, then that artery is going to spurt out blood. So it's going to spurt and you can determine directionality at that point. So you can see that someone was standing, standing, and then maybe they started going down. Maybe they tried to raise themselves back up. Maybe they kept going down. Um, this one is going to be um, back spatter from, and we, this is something we look for at a suicide. So if someone has shot themselves and they had close contact, 
then we are going to be looking for blood on their hand. If there is no blood on their hand, it doesn't mean it's not a suicide, but we're definitely going to be looking at it a lot more closely. So um, that should uh, cause some kind of back spatter there. Uh, this is expirated blood, which is what happens when, say, maybe you cough out blood or blood comes out of your nose, uh, like a bloody sneeze, um, but it will have bubbles in it, so little oxygen bubbles in it, and um, so you would know it was expirated or came out from the inside. This would be capillary spark down here on the bottom left. And that's just arteries are bigger, so they have a bigger spurt. Capillary, if it's cut, it's just going to have a smaller spurt line. Um, the one in the middle with the long linear lines, that's cast off. Cast off is very uh, cool because we can determine exactly how many blows took place. So we know that that first blow, there's no blood, right? So this is now the first blood source. So when they bring it back up, blood will spatter and then come back down, hit the blood source, cast off again, hit, cast off. So we can count how many times. So here you can see there's one, two, three. Um, here's your impact spatter um, at the bottom, and it's the one that's more fan-like, and it's the one that we use for stringing. So it's the, um, the high, medium, or low velocity spatter. And basically for that, we're looking at low spatter is maybe something like somebody hit someone in the face with their fist. Um, and those drops um, are predominantly about four millimeters or more in size, the diameter of each individual drop. And then for our medium spatter, it's like one to four millimeters. And then for our high, it's one millimeter or less, meaning very, very tiny, and we call it almost mist-like. So um, a gun, a gun will create a fine mist and um, very, very tiny, and that's, again, why we have to use that little micrometer because we actually have to measure those in micrometers, not millimeters, because they're so tiny. So when we also talk about blood, we also have to talk about blood where it should be and blood where it shouldn't be. So um, when there's no blood there, we call it a void. So the picture on the right is obviously someone had, was laying there. So if we came upon this scene and there was no body, we would say, okay, well, somebody is missing, right? Um, there's a void. We also look at blood where it shouldn't be. So um, going back to the example of say, the husband comes home and says, I came home and my wife was laying on the kitchen floor bleeding to death. I don't know what happened. Um, and say she has a gunshot wound and he says, oh, well, I'm bloody because I was giving her CPR. Well, we could explain blood on the outside of your clothes for CPR. What we can't explain are little tiny spatters inside your pants. That means that some, something very violent projected that blood and blood went everywhere and that's blood where it should not be. So that's an example of that. Um, blood has a predictable drying time. So we end up with a peripheral stain. So when blood dries, you get kind of that skeletonized area. Um, so we can uh, do um, similar simulations in the lab to determine how long blood has been um, on a surface and how long it would take it to dry. And remember in the beginning, I said blood is not that easy to clean up. And that's because we have chemicals that will show us where blood was or where blood um, was. They tried to clean it up, they can no longer see it, but the proteins in blood um, are enhanced with chemicals. So this is, you know, the picture on the left is where someone tried to clean up blood um, around a sink. And then on the right, that's the kind of thing where we had the transfer contact pattern and we could only see part of the um, shoe pattern, what we would do at the scene is we would photograph that exactly as we saw it and then we would take our samples, we would um, uh, squirt the blue star on it, dim the lights, and then photograph it again and we'll have more of the pattern there because there's a lot more there than what can be seen with the actual human eye. 
So now that you know a little bit about the different patterns and you know um, kind of what they look like, we're going to try and analyze our own case. So here we go. Oops. All right. So as a blood stain pattern analyst, you have been called to the following scene by the police investigator. All right. The police were called to the following scene when the apartment caretaker found the following blood patterns in the building and within suite 203. The resident in suite 203 cannot be located and is not known who the victim is or what the person's injuries might be. You're asked by the investigating officer, can you tell me what happened? Where was the victim initially attacked? What was the victim's position during the attack? What types of force created the blood stains? Where and what do you think his injuries might be? And we're gonna take a look. So the first pair, uh, photograph that you're gonna see is going up the stairs to the um, apartment entrance. So um, this is going up the stairs into an apartment building. So do you see anything that is familiar? Things that we talked about. Right here, what did we talk about? This might be, I said we see this a lot of times at scenes when somebody's had an injury on their head, right? Right, uh, Sandra says transfer pattern and Audrey says cast off and transfer. Yes. So we see all of that. So you see here's uh, probably where um, a bloody hand is wiped down the rail. Here we have some transfer. Here we have some cast off and some impact. So you're seeing a little bit of all of it going up the stairs. Here's a little better shot. Remember how I said sometimes with transfer patterns, you can see this feathering to determine a direction of travel. So this is a good, um, shot of how our hair leaves a little bit of a feathering effect so we can determine direction of travel. And then you can see there's still um, some swipes, probably some wipes, lots of different stuff going on here. This is the hall going down toward uh, 203. So this is by the apartment 201. So we see more but we can tell that the person that's being injured is upright, correct? They're not down here on the ground and they're not crawling out, they're still on their feet. And then here we go, getting closer to 203. Same kind of stuff. Now, when we enter 203, we're observing blood stains on the back of the door, the wall, and above this um, stove near the bedroom. So here we have different stains again. And here's the wall. And then here is the entrance of the bedroom door. So Based on your observations here, remember we were basically photographing as we enter the scene, so that's why it's kind of moving backward. But going back to the beginning of going backward, um, we would basically say, if we were doing an analysis, that in all likelihood, our attack started somewhere here in the kitchen based on the amount of blood that's there on the um, comparatively. and that the person was upright because we have all of these at very high um, heights. And then we have the person going down the hallway. They're continuing down the hall. They're getting the mess beat out of them on the way down the stairs. So what are the, 
questions that we were asked. I can get back to them. Sorry. So where was the victim initially attacked? We would probably say in the kitchen. What was the victim's position during the attack? They were standing. Um, what type of force created the blood stain? We know it wasn't mist-like, right? It was fairly good size. So we know it was a fairly large weapon, something like a, it wasn't a fist in all likelihood because a fist would be even smaller, but it was probably something like a baseball bat, um, a lead pipe, um, something like that, that was heavy in nature and creates a medium spatter. Um, let's see, what type of force created it? Again, we're going to say it's about medium uh, velocity. And then where or what injuries do you think that person might have? Well, we know they have a head injury, right? Because we have bloody hair. So we know that there's something going on with the head at least. But we also have some uh, blood at some lower level, so that could be injuries uh, to other areas. And we know that we have injury, or at least blood has um, been encountered on the hand, because we do have a handprint going down the stairs. Um, and then the injuries, again, we know they at least have a head injury. So those are the things that we can determine when we're looking at blood spatter analysis. And I will take any questions you might have. I don't know if they're if people are unmuted or. No, I'll, let me see if I can do that. Unmute everyone. Okay, I'm allowing you guys to talk. So anybody who has a question, start speaking up. I know some of you have asked if uh, she'll talk about some cases she's been on or some experiences she's had. Yeah, so I, I guess you just have to be more specific about what you wanted to know. But um, I think um, one of the most interesting things to me was uh, sometimes uh, the first cases that I've been on, I would all the time think that there was um, like brain or tissue in the blood and um, come to find out later that that's just where blood has coagulated. So it becomes a big clumpy disgusting mess and it will look like you know, brain tissue or other types of tissue. So you have to learn to recognize the difference. Um, so that's, you know, something that's fairly interesting. Um, you know, we do have, um, blood does have an, an odor, which is unusual. Um, so that's something that a lot of people don't realize that it does have a, a smell. Um, I can't really explain it. You just, you do know it if you smell it. So I don't know if that helps or. Jessie? I have a question. Uh, yeah, I have a I, oh, sorry. I have a question um, real quick. You said it was a protein that lit up. You can add a chemical and it lights up the protein in the blood. I, I'm a nurse and I'm an educator, and I literally just finished giving a lecture on hematology and the different parts of the blood. What protein is that? This is my nerd question. What protein is it that lights up? I actually do not know exactly which one it is. I just know that it binds to the proteins that are found in blood, and I don't know if it's just because of the nutrients that are running through or whatever. But um, there's two major chemicals, if you want to look at it, that we do use, and that's luminol. Um, and then uh, Blue Star. We've kind of moved away from using luminol because luminol uh, degrades DNA. Blue Star does not have a negative effect on DNA. 
that said, like I said, we document everything before we're ever going to spray a chemical on blood, right? So we've already photographed it. We've already taken all of our photographs. Um, we've done everything that we need to do to properly document that scene before we're ever going to damage it in any way. So um, when we add those chemicals, it's basically just a little blue tablet. You put it in a little bottle of water, you shake it up and you know, you just squirt it and then turn out the lights and you know, watch the little glow fairies. But cool. um, yeah, you can see um, if you YouTube it or whatever, you can see um, little demonstrations or whatever that are done. Cool, thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, Amanda wants to know about your biggest pet peeves about crime shows. Um, inaccuracy. That's why I said I do like Dexter to the extent that he was usually fairly, fairly accurate with um, what he said about different patterns and things. Um, CSI makes me insane because they do a lot of things CSIs don't do. They interrogate suspects, they make arrests, they carry guns. Um, for the most part, crime scene has moved away from the sworn officer to the unsworn. Um, if you think about, say, your um, street officer and your crime scene investigator, you're looking at two totally different personality types. You want your officer on the street to be able to make a snap decision very quickly. You want your crime scene investigator to be meticulous, detailed, and think about things. So you're not even really looking they're just so opposite uh, that we've really just moved away from, um, it used to be, you know, the crime scene investigator was the homicide guy that had 20 years in and he was just kind of getting tired of being on the street. So they'd move him to crime scene. Um, they've moved away from that. We're really looking at it as more of a scientific profession now. Um, cases like OJ Simpson, um, uh, Brandon Mayfield, um, you know, a lot of the big forensic mistakes um, that have cost us uh, in our reputation um, have really kind of moved it toward more of the, the science versus the, um, you know, police operations. Uh, Carlos wants to know your most complex case that you worked on. Good day. Good day. Uh, complex. I don't know that complex. I don't know what they mean by complex. So they can get into. Yeah, I'm not sure what you mean by complex. Okay. Uh, they're all interesting. The one thing that I love about crime scene, and this is what I always tell my students, um, it's never the same thing. Every scene is different. Even if you had a serial killer that was killing everyone exactly the same way, same modus operandi, you know, took the same trophies at every case, it's always going to be different because no two scenes are alike ever. Um, so the interesting and really fun thing about it is that you, you're never doing the same thing twice, even if you're doing the same thing over and over, which is what crime scene is. You're very uh, methodical. You do the same thing, the same sequence, um, over and over and over again. And if I had to do that in a, like a laboratory, it would get very boring. But the ability to be able to do it um, at a scene that's very different, that's more interesting. Okay, um, Anna wants to know about blood thinning medication and does it have an effect on your scene? Yes, um, well, I mean, just like it has an effect on you, it would be a bloodier scene. So um, the same thing with, um, we've had people that have died from alcoholism and they'll bleed out everywhere before uh, they die and you'll think someone has been murdered. Um, so yes, what you, blood thinners will definitely, you'll bleed more, so there'll be more blood. So it will definitely have an effect on the amount. Um, head wounds, head wounds bleed a lot. So, you know, you can have the smallest cut on your head and it'll look like, you know, a horror show, but it was really just not, you know, just something needs a few stitches. So it just really just depends. And then, like I said, the arterial spurting, right? So the art, if you hit an artery or, even capillaries, then that can be a really bloody scene as well. 
Okay, and Phyllis is asking about how many people are generally on a scene to analyze it? All right, so well, it really depends on what agency you're with. So I do most of my work with the 14th Judicial Medical Examiner's Office. So I go out with the death investigator. Um, so, uh, you know, you always have a first arriving officer on the scene, then they'll call in crime scene if they need crime scene. Um, crime scene usually only goes to your major scenes, your death scenes, or major crimes. Um, if it's just like someone broke into somebody's car, we're not going to call out crime scene for that. Most officers have a camera and a fingerprint kit in their car, and they'll handle that themselves. So, um, you know, you'll have your first officer, responding officer on the scene, you'll have some supervisors that will come in and then it just depends on the agency. So some agencies do teamwork where you'll have two CSIs. Some smaller agencies will only have one CSI. Um, they'll call in someone who's on call if they need um, additional hands. Um, but, you know, it just really depends on the scene. Then you have, you know, major scenes like, um, I'm trying to think the one um, in Jacksonville where the gamer shot up, um, it wasn't a mall, but they were doing like a gaming competition. And um, I was talking to the guy who went and did all their Pharo scans and he was talking about all the mirrors that I think maybe it was like a bar or something so it had a lot of mirrors. Um, and all the mirrors that were involved uh, messing up their, their scans, but um, they bring in, you know, outside agencies like FDLE or um, mm -hmm. other places to come and help when they need more help. As far as a, a really bloody scene that needs to be worked by a blood stain, a blood stain pattern an analyst, um, you would want to bring in someone who specializes in that field uh, for that and you would need to you know you pretty much quickly know that the blood is really important at this particular scene so that's when you would probably bring that person in if you didn't have one in your department already mm -hmm. okay uh, Caitlin wants to know has a question but I want to acknowledge Casey she's uh, logged off but she's in St. Paul um, having to deal with the or living near the riots and so I wanted to acknowledge her and um appreciate her taking the time to be with us tonight and absolutely let her be safe know we're, right we're thinking about her um caitlin wants to know uh, can you explain more about finding how finding blood where it is not supposed to be can lead to finding out what happens like how blood can get on the inside of the pants is that something that's always looked for it is not always looked for but what we will do um is we'll collect a suspect's clothing for that very reason um, because blood does funny things um, and just like with cleanup so people think oh well I got it all but then you find a little something on the edge of the couch you know that they didn't see um, or it will be um, under an item and you would say how on earth did blood get under something but it's just that you know it can it travel with such force that it will wiggle its way under there so um, that it's just hard for someone to explain that. Um, also, if someone has, say, same example, said, oh, I was trying to revive them, that's why I have blood on me, that's, that's well and good for why you might have a saturation stain on you. But it doesn't explain how you get projected blood spatter on you, right? That high velocity, very, very tiny mist. How on earth did that get there? So it just helps us kind of say, okay, Probable, improbable. Okay. It looks like that's all we've got in questions. So that great timing, right? Right up after Perfect. seven o'clock. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. I'll turn my video back on so you guys can see me if you want to see me. Um, you don't have to see me. <laughs> Uh, thank you guys so much for attending again, again tonight. We had fun as always. Oh, Angela, you've got a question? Go back over here. Oop. Angela, she raised your hand. Where are you? Let me unmute you. Do you see, do you hear it now? I hear you, yes. Okay. Um, 
she said that uh, crime scene investigators don't usually uh, carry weapons now. Do right. they have people, do they have units called out to protect them? Uh, or if the suspect or suspects are still around, do they have protection or are they just kind of on their own? No, there's always a first officer on the scene. So that first arriving officer at the scene always secures the scene. They're the ones who um, basically determine if it's safe, they call for backup. If it's not, they determine that there's um, no one hiding in the home, that kind of thing. Um, and then they also put up that boundary. So, you know, the crime scene tape that you see. And then an officer is always outside of that station there, and that would always be a sworn officer. A lot of times I have a clipboard, they're figuring out who's going in, who's going out, um, and then they stick around in case, you know, anything else happens. We really limit who can come through that crime scene tape, but, you know, uh, we call them the looky-loos. So say it's a Friday night and there's not a lot going on, they'll all just kind of gather at one scene, but they'll stay on the other side of the tape, you know, chit chat with each other, find out what's going on. Um, but you really want to limit who can come into the scene for contamination reasons. So, um, yeah, but there's always plenty of sworn officers around, but no, for the most part, it's about 60, 40 right now in the U S moving very quickly, more like to an 80, 20 for the sworn versus non-sworn. Um, I know here in, uh, Bay County, Florida, we're just starting to move to the non-sworn for the Bay County Sheriff's Office, but Panama City has been non-sworn. Lynn Haven is non-sworn, Springfield is non-sworn. So um, the non-sworn officer, and by non-sworn, I just mean you're not, um, you don't carry a weapon, you don't have to go, you know, uh, learn how to, you know, drive like a maniac because we don't want you to drive the crime scene van like a maniac, right? So um, those they found help um, officers not be gone. So if you have a crime scene investigator that's sworn, they have to spend one day a month at the target range to keep up their standards. They have to, uh, you know, throw out spike strips, you know, one day a month um, to keep up their uh, driving abilities and everything. So it takes them away from their actual job. So having a non-sworn officer for crime scene has actually worked out very well for most agencies. Some smaller agencies, they still just don't have enough crime to have a full-time crime scene investigator, so they have to have a sworn officer so that that person can still, when they're not doing crime scene, help with the funeral procession in town or, or whatever else is going on. So they're, they're kind of working double duties. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Manda would like to know, do you testify at trials or just you send someone else to present your findings? It, it will, it, it depends on what the um, district attorney wants. So sometimes the district attorney will want uh, the lead investigator. Um, they'll, they try for the most part to put in as little as possible. Um, they may only put in the photos. They may put in a, a Pharaoh scan. Um, they, and, and I guess that's basically here. So the way our district attorney thinks of it is, he doesn't want two, three, four day bore the jury um, kind of thing. He wants to take his very best evidence and put it forward. So it just depends on what is needed for that, whether it's the crime scene investigator, the death investigator, the medical examiner, or who's going to testify. But our particular uh, district attorney tries not to overload the jury um, because he just doesn't want to end up in that situation where um, you lose their attention. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Don't see any hands. Well, I just want to say thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. Everyone and stay safe. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, next week, we will be having Dr. Timothy Colston, uh, who's a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Florida and research associate with Smithsonian's Museum of Natural History. Um, he's going to be talking about uh, the uncovering the herpetofauna of Abyssinia, reptiles and amphibians in Ethiopia. Um, so please join us next week, same time, 6 p.m. on Thursday, Eastern Standard Time. And uh, we are hopefully have Madison Social be, will be up and running and ready to join us 
with their curbside to go. Uh, we've been trying to get them ready. They are back open and uh, willing to join us. Um, they've just been trying to get everything ready for us. So um, they're our, our partner in the community and we want to support them as much as possible. So please uh, make sure to drop by before you and get your cocktail to go and uh, join us at 6 p.m. Thank you so much and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte.